Whoa. I am excited. You may be said, I'm really excited about a vision that God has given us. Say vision. I don't, I don't want to move forward without understanding it's a vision of God. And any time we get a vision of God, there's a voice that will do everything it can to stop the vision of God. Visions of God are never stopped by the power of the enemy. Visions of God are stopped within ourselves. So when God has a vision in scripture to conquer a nation, and God says, go fight, it's an automatic win. Whether you have 300 against 20,000 or one against a giant, it's a win. When God promised the Israelites the promised land, it was a promised land. It's in the vocabulary. I'm giving you that land. It was not the people in that land that defeated them from seeing the vision come to pass because they were never strong enough to stop the vision of God from coming to pass. The devil could throw everything he has at a vision of God like he did with Jesus. He threw everything he had locked them up into a tomb, but you cannot conquer a vision of God. There will be a resurrection. God says, my word will not return void. It will accomplish what I've set it out to do. The only one that can stop a vision from coming to pass a God vision from coming to pass is you. Now, the devil can give suggestions, but just because he's given suggestions doesn't mean you need to agree with him. Come on, you guys get this. So every vision of God will come with suggestions of the enemy, like this. You're too busy. We heard some of them. You don't know what you're doing. You're not good enough or even talk negative about it. What is this? Is this a numbers thing? And before you know it, you're listening to that voice and, and that voice could be just, that voice could be just this, how you approach vision all the time. It's kind of like your default voice. Instead of talking yourself in, you find yourself consistently talking yourself out of the dream or maybe even procrastinating, or even doing this, doing a half effort and just going through the motions. You'll never accomplish a God vision with a half-hearted heart. And that's why you'll hear people, well, I tried it, it didn't work. Exactly. They'll say, I tried it, it didn't work. It's in the language they only tried. They should have said, I've committed. And just because it hasn't worked yet doesn't mean it's not going to work. This will come to pass. How do you know? It was a God vision. Right? Though it tarry, it will come. Wait. Stand. And when you've done all to stand, stand. This is all about the original dream that God gave me to start the church. That night, it was a regular night. I did not know that that night, the seed of the Wayworld Outreach would be given to me in a dream. And he said this, go, they're sheep, and you're their shepherd. And if you don't go, they won't have a shepherd. And I knew what that meant. After I had the dream, it was different. And God was telling me that I've assigned people for you to love, care for, lead, and sacrifice your life for. I knew that's what it meant because I know the shepherd's job. Have you ever seen a real shepherd? 
It's not a glorious job. As a matter of fact, there's not people signing up, I want to be a shepherd. You just like grow into that and like, you're a shepherd. Because you know what shepherds do? They stay 24-7 with their sheep. And all they do is live to make sure they got pasture. They'll move from one pasture to another pasture to another pasture. If one of their sheep gets sick, they do everything. They're the doctors. They take care of that little sheep or lamb until it's healthy again. If they're giving birth, they're there helping giving birth. The life of a shepherd is a 24-7 a year job serving the sheep. It's, it's not a glorious job. So I knew when God says they're sheep and you're their shepherd, I knew it wasn't this. You're going to be the pastor of a great church and there's going to be, it. that's not what this is about. That's never my heart. My heart is for people being everything that God has called them to be and we're shepherd and we're loving them. Now, when I hear the stories of Rafi and, and I hear the other stories that I just heard right now, that, that touch it, that, that makes it worthwhile. How many love those stories? What the power of 12 is, is about those stories. It's not about the numbers, it's about the people that represent those numbers. And it's about the stories of someone that came to this church that was broken, lost, and felt like nobody in the world loved them, and maybe it was their reality. Maybe everybody walked out on that person. And then they're invited to church, or they're invited to be part of your circle. And you invite them because you love them. You do not invite them because you want to fill all your spots. You invite them because you love them. And then you say something like this, if you'd be willing to be part of my 12, I am willing to lay down my life for you and help you become everything that God wants you and created you to be. I'll sacrifice, I'll call you, I'll serve you, I'll wash your feet, I will do whatever it takes for you to accomplish the vision that God has called you to accomplish. That's what the power of 12 is all about. It's a power of love. It's a power of unity. And when, when Joey talks, when he talked about submitting, I've learned this, that to be a real leader, you must be humble. So the first test of great leadership, like I know, like just like that he came up here, but I know like Joey and his brother have a call to pastor. I know it's on their lives, but, but the enemy knows that if they never submit to the pastor, they can never be a pastor. It will never happen. Because the first level of leadership is just plain humility. Because how God works, he works through impartation. That means the next king will always be a loyal servant. We must become servants to the king and his mission. And he said, well, I could serve the king but can you serve his servants? Because to serve the king, you must wash the disciples' feet. What, what I mean by that is, is that you could never really serve the king and submit to the king if you can't even submit to your brothers and sisters that you can see. How can you love God that you can't see and you can't even love your brothers and sisters that you can see? So... This is what it is all about. Now, I'm up here, 
And I'm speaking from my heart. This is not no notes and all this stuff, and I was planning to say nothing. I wasn't planning. To, I, I, when I come up here on leadership meetings, I just come up here and say, God, speak whatever you want to speak. So right now, I'm speaking from the heart of God, and he's saying, look, this is all about you accomplishing what I've called you to accomplish. And I'm going to pass it on to you. They're sheep, and you're their shepherd. And if you don't go, they won't have a shepherd. You know what that means? That there's people that you're supposed to take care of, love, mentor, and stop letting the devil convince you that you don't have enough experience or you're not whatever enough, whatever that is. You don't have enough time, you are not enough, you don't know enough word. No, uh, uh, the devil even convince you no one likes you, whatever. Whatever that story that you keep telling yourself is, you got to shut down that story because that story has no power to conquer your assignment unless you keep receiving it. Okay? So, we're here, and I want you to think about this. Why would we do the minimum? Why wouldn't we think the maximum because the measure you dish out is a measure that's coming back so when you have a minimum mentality you'll have a minimum life and God is always calling us to our limits and then he says let's go ahead and surpass them Come on, isn't that the way it is? Let's go to these limits and let's go right past them. Because when you get to your limits, the, the, when we start surpassing them, we start getting to God results. How many want some God results? When God's done with you, you should be surprised. Like, what? How did God do that great move through me? Because, you know, the Bible says God takes the foolish things of this world and he confounds the wise. I want, I want you to get this. He's not looking for the most talented. He's not looking for the most gifted. What he's saying is, who can I send? And someone says in this house, send me. And you know when God's sending you to? He's sending you to people if we just get this in our soul that it is about a person and I know there's grown adults that you see all around you but there's so many grown adults that are sitting around you that are really still little kids and they're hurting because they still haven't gotten over what happened to them when they were a little kid and their lives their bodies began to grow but they no longer were developing emotionally because they got stuck in a moment. And you, you're like, saying, why don't you grow up? And they're saying, what do you mean? Shut up. Stupid. And, and the reason they'll say something like that because they're still defending themselves. I'll punch you. I'll hit you. I'm going to pay you back. They're still, they're still here. And they're still hurting. And I know that, you, and, then they, and then they put on this facade. I got my stuff together. I'm macho man, or I got my stuff together. And what, however, guys, girls, and we're just this big facade to protect ourselves from being hurt anymore. And we don't let people get real close. And I want you to know, there's a lot of hurting people out there. And it's time for us. And you know what's going to work? Love. There's some people that won't open up until they absolutely know you love them. Come on, we're here to love unlovable people and love them, come on, into the kingdom of heaven. We're not here just to love the lovable. That's not, that's not very, there's no reward for that. If you're kind to those who are kind to you, what reward is there for that? No, but there's no reward. The pagans do that. If you only give to people that could give back to you, what reward is there for that? 
There is no reward for that. Because you're actually, you rub my back, or you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. That's not what Christianity is about. Say, so if you never ever scratch my back, I am good. I'll lay down everything. I'll, I'll surrender my back to be whipped and tortured for you. So this is what everything's about. And yes, there's a strategy, but why would you, the Bible said, if you're gonna go to war, wouldn't you count the cost? Of course you would. I mean, would you go to war with no strategy? And I, and, I, and I think the church is the only group in the world that's just trying to constantly ad lib stuff with no preparation. We need a plan. We need a strategy. But this is the most important thing. We need love for God and love for people. A strategy that's a great strategy with no love is just a strategy. That's not what we're here to do. We are here to love people. And I don't know who's assigned to you, but I know right now they're desperate and they're hurting. And if you don't come into their lives, they might be suicidal. If you don't come into their lives, they might be stuck in a rut that never get out. If you don't come into their life, they're ready to go into an abusive cycle for the rest of their life. If you don't come into their lives, they might end up in hell for eternity. If you don't come into their lives, they're going to continue living in their nightmare, in their torment, in their sleepless nights, constantly. Someone needs freedom. And the only way they're going to get it, it's not going to be getting more information, they're going to have to get into deeper relationships. And this is what you got. You got 168 hours a week. Now, this is what we're actually saying. Make some time to fulfill the Great Commission. Make some time for your purpose. And you know what that means? You might have to say no to something else so you can finally say yes to God. Stop saying no to God so you keep saying yes to everything else. So we, it's, it's, gonna, it's not gonna be easy, I'll tell you why, because every new thing that God wants to do in your life, it's out of your comfort zone and it's definitely not in your schedule. Because if it was on your schedule, you'd already be doing it. New, most people are stuck in a rut, cycle, 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 cycle. Have you seen yourself ever in a cycle? You know, okay, let's do this. This is even easier. Have you seen someone else in a cycle? <laughs> Isn't it sometimes to see their cycle easier than your cycle? And what that, that means you, you see them, you go, oh, I see it coming. They're fine right now. I said, no, they're, they're, they're not fine. They're in a cycle. I already know what's coming next. I've already seen this record play. And until, I want you to get this, until I love, I love what she said, I'm done. I'm done with that. I'm done with who I was. I am right now resisting who I was. I am done. Is there anybody done with their old cycle? And by that is, are you ready to start a, behold, I got, behold, God saying, behold, God saying, behold, can't you see I'm doing a new thing? Is it, behold, can't you see I'm doing a new thing? God's doing it. And I am so honored that we're here. I don't know how many people are here, but the reality is by September 15th, we're going to grow. How many know growth is good? Come on. How many know growth is good? How many know growth is godly? If something's not growing, it's not healthy. You should grow spiritually. You should not be stuck in a rut year after year. Come on. Stuff that you're dealing with now should be easy for you later. Someone say growth. If you're going to the gym and you're not, there's not like growth, you're probably just going to the gym. 
You're not getting any stronger. There's nothing happening. You're just probably just going to the gym. And then they're going to, if you're still, how long have you been going to the gym? Like, well, eight, eight, well, nine months? Has there been any improvement? Well, I don't know. I just look at the weights. I don't know if that's going to help. And I look at that treadmill. I just, well, I just, one of these days I'll get on that treadmill. Why not go on the treadmill? Oh, no, 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 because I'm going to get tired. <laughs> That's hard. Oh, okay. So you want growth without a commitment to get through some pain. And you know why I say pain? Because when you're ready to go, there's, all, there's always this growth pains. And you know what's part of the pain? Is dying to your old self, your, our old habits, our old comfort zones. I'm dying to my old friends, my old associates, the so old ways I've been doing it. There's something dying within me right now because after death, after the pain, after the suffering, comes the gain, comes the resurrection, comes the breakthrough, comes the new me. Even giving a birth to a baby, there's always pain before there's a new baby. And you know, you know what you got to do? Because I know all about this. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know all about it. Push, Lisa. Push, Lisa. Push. I know all about it. <laughs> I just got to be a good cheerleader, right? But I know this, in the spiritual realm, we're all pushing out and pushing through obstacles that are in our way from the new thing being birthed in our lives. And most people are scared of the pain to get the gain. They're scared of the pain to get the gain. So right when it, the pain starts hitting, they start running. They start looking for other churches. They start looking for other ideas. They start starting over again. Are you in a cycle of constantly starting over? Not anymore. Because this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be coached. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to be open. There's no purpose. The Power of 12 is not an information meeting. It's an intimacy meeting. What I mean by that is, if it turns into information, we don't need necessarily a lot more information. We need to be more real. Joy, I love what you just, you're real. But as you're, while you're doing that, there's more healing happening. I could tell God was healing you even more because for you to say it was even delivering you. How, how many understand that's powerful? And you know what's so awesome? The more real we are, and I'll tell you this, the more attractive we are. Because when we're not real, we're not very attractive because we've got walls of protection. Like, don't get too close. You know, get away from me. Don't you get too close right now. I don't want you to know my little dirty secrets. Well, if we're going to go into Power of 12, we're going to let all the dirty secrets out of the closet. So this is who I am. This is what I'm struggling with. And you know what's going to happen? No one's going to talk about it. We're just going to love you through it. You're going to grow. We're going to overcome. And the devil no longer, has a, no longer has authority over you because there's nothing to hide. So you could talk about me all day long. I already told everybody what I'm dealing with. Nothing to hide here. Because the devil loves dirty little secrets. So we're just going to let it out. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to grow. And we're going to grow in intimacy with God. We're going to really get to know God. We're going to really get to love God. And we're going to be committed. Say committed. Yeah. Committed. That's what a disciple is anyways. You're dis a disciple is a committed follower, follower of Jesus, of Jesus, and radically 100% obeys his commands. That's it. That's what I am, a disciple. Right? So we're going to make time. Someone say make time. 
Make time. Make time for others and make time to be discipled. Make time to disciple others and make time to be discipled. Make time to disciple others and make time to be discipled. I don't have no time. Make time. How could you make a disciple if you can't even make time? See, this is a command. Now, not, now we're not being legalistic here. We have to understand this is how we're going to reach the world. That's why he didn't give it a suggestion. He didn't say, you know, try to make some disciples. He goes, no, go, go and make disciples of all nations. Go do this. It's a verb, action. Right? And you know what that means? Make students. It means, it means make learners. Um, this is what we do. Help people become. When make means help to become or cause to become. Help them become what God has called them to become. Man, I'm standing up here because my mom helped me become. I'm the first Christian Garcia in my family. It was in there, but I needed a mentor to help me become everything that God called me to be. I needed her to help me become. And you need your mentors to help you become, and they need you to help them become. And so how do I build leadership? You have to build trust. Leadership is, is influence. What is leadership? You know what influence means? It means this that people are now willingly willing to follow you. You have influence when people are willingly, they will willingly follow you. You don't have influence if they're, you're forcing them to follow you. You have influence when they're willingly following you and they'll never willingly follow you until they know you love them. Okay, and what I'm asking you to do is for, for the Lord, for me, is this can you let them know how much the Lord loves them? Please, can you let them know? God said, Can you let them know how much I love them, please? And so how, how do I let them know how much you love them? He goes, love them with the love I put in your heart. Just give what I've, just show them my love the way you treat them. Please, could you let them know how much I love them by loving them? And me as a pastor, I wish that I could sit down with every single one of you, have dinner all, every night, get to know each other, and just hug everybody every day. I would love to do that. I'm not saying I won't get around hugging. Probably I'll, I'll get around to it. <laughs> because I, I, when I get around, I'm hugging. And, you know, I, 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 I love loving people. But I do know this, that it's impossible for me to love everyone with the love that I want to love you with only because... I, am a, I don't have the ability as a human to have that time, to have that, you don't have it, to have it in your schedule. So this is how it's going to happen. I need you to hug them for the Lord. I would even say this as, your, as, as a pastor, please hug them for me. Hug them for me. Listen for, for me that they would know I love them because you're loving them for the Lord and you're loving them through your, your, you're letting them. this love come from the Lord. It also comes from our house. Our pastor loves you. When they're sick, love them for me. Go visit them. Love them for the Lord. What you've done to the least of them, Jesus, says, you've done to me. Love them. And then you know what's going to happen? There's going to be a lot of trust built because they got convinced of one thing, man, you love them. And remember when it gets a little difficult to love, that's when love really counts. Because when it gets a little difficult to love them, most people walked out on them, but you didn't this time. And you know, and, and, and people that have been, they, they put walls up, 
because they've been hurt so much, they don't let you love them easy. So what they do, they put the walls up, they'll keep you at a distance to see if you run out like everyone else ran out. And what you do is say, I don't care how crazy you act, I ain't going nowhere, so what are you gonna do now? You're crazy though, you're right, you're crazy. You're plum loco. But we're gonna love that loco right out of you, that loca right out for you. But we're not going nowhere. We're gonna help you get set free, we're gonna teach you, we're gonna be there for you, and you keep showing us our power to you're welcome, and let's do this together, amen? Amen. So, that's what this is all about, and we've seen, I really believe this, is that this is a discipleship, um, I think vision, system, that I think, that I really believe that the churches all over the world need. Because the enemy has stripped the church of their real identity. We have a lot, millions and millions of spectators in the church, but we don't have a lot of disciples in the church, and we definitely don't have a lot of disciple makers. And if you're struggling with really investing in discipling, like Mike said, you better check that heart. Right? Because we, how many know we need a new heart? We gotta ask, like, oh God, that's just the way I am. I don't like people that much. Okay, stop it. That's why you must be born again. Come on. Right? We're a new creation. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So we got to ask God for the right heart. And not only the right heart, ask God for the right passion. And this, this would be a good question. Like if we were in a small group right now, we could really get intimate right now. Because I would begin to ask, what are you really passionate about? And basically, it's kind of like passing the mic. And it causes you to kind of look at, what am I really passionate about? And be honest. Like, I'm really passionate about sports. Great. Let's be honest. I'm really passionate about shopping. Be honest. I love it. As a matter of fact, you ask me to go shopping, I'll go anytime. If there's a sale, Black Friday, I am there. I'll sp- as a matter of fact, I'll get a tent and stay out there. Right? Well, you're passionate about something. There's no excuses. But will you ever do a tent to help somebody else out? Well, then you, maybe you would have because you're not passionate about it. Because when you're passionate about it, there are no excuses. Right? So what are you passionate about? He says, I'm really passionate about music. Oh, awesome. I'm really passionate about the Dodgers. Yeah. Right? I'm really passionate about the Raiders. I'm, re- I'm really passionate about my job. I'm really passionate. That's beautiful. But is there any passion left for God's purpose and assignment and his people? And I'm not saying you shouldn't be passionate about all kinds of, I, you know, I love my li- wife passionately. That's fine. I love my kids. And I, but, but I got to make sure that those passions don't take over. My number one passion should be in my heart. And that's passion for God. And that's passion for his people. When Jesus went to the cross, is a, it was a walk of passion. You beat me. You mock me. You rip my back wide open. You put a cross on me. You put thorns on my head. You strip me naked. I'm God. You don't give me anything to drink. And I'm walking. And I'm walking. And I'm walking. And I'm walking. I should maybe even be dead with the 39 lashes you gave me. My back is ripped wide open, and now you're having me hold the cross and drag the cross that you're going to crucify me on. You've pulled my beard out. 
You've punched me as hard as you can. What is keeping me moving forward? I fall. I'm on a cross, I can't breathe. And then I say, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. What's keeping me on this cross is my love for you. I passionately love you. The price must be paid for me and you to have a relationship forever. It's a lot of pain. It's a lot of suffering. But to me, it's worth it. And then we serve God with hardly sometimes any passion. We look at God's people as a nuisance. And we're trying to protect our whole schedule from ministry. I don't got time for that. And I want you, I want you to get this. That's not what Jesus said about you. So why would we say it about somebody else? That's all, that's all I was saying. I, I do my best to give my best. I'm never thinking minimum. I'm just not. I'm always thinking maximum. What's the most we could do for the people? What's the most we could do to develop? I'm always thinking what's the most we could do? Because when I'm thinking what's the most we could do, I believe this, I'm thinking like God because God's thinking what's the most I could do? So we're here and this is a historical moment and we'll never get prideful about it. And the reason I'm, 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 I'm doing a precursor right now, God is ready to use you mightily. We're gonna start seeing exponential growth in our church. This right here, every single one of you, really, really quickly are gonna be leaders. I mean, I mean you're, this is what I'm saying, you're already leaders. We're gonna help you though. And some of you have two or three. Next meeting, you'll have 12. Some of you don't have anything. You're not even part of a power 12. Next meeting, you'll be part of a power 12. Next meeting, you might have one person for the first time in your life that you're pouring into. You're meeting at Starbucks on a regular basis, and you're just opening up with each other and say, how you doing, bro? I want to let you know I'm here for you. And, and, and we just, we're, going, we're going to go over this Bible study, but the most important thing is that you're doing okay. Is there any areas you're struggling in right now? I can tell you, man, I've been struggling with this area. And let's talk about it. Let's open up with each other. And what's going to happen, miracles are going to happen. People are going to get delivered at Starbucks. They can't stop the anointing of God. Once, come on, once, once, once we start opening up, we bring in the Word and we're loving. People are going to get beat. saved at Starbucks. Crazy things are going to happen. It's going to happen. Are you excited about that? Because you know what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen with, with you is you're going to be so excited about your purpose. You're never going to, please, be careful. Never do ministry for the sake of doing ministry. Because it will become a burden to you. Do ministry because you passionately love God and you passionately love people and they need you. Don't go through the motions. I, need, I, I love you. Don't do ministry for position and accolades because that's the only reward you'll ever get. Do ministry because you love God and you love people. And real love for people is that you'll do everything you can to help them meet their needs and also help them become everything that God has called them to be. You'll never have to self-promote because when you humble yourself and I humble myself, this is what's gonna happen. You'll consistently get God promotions. It's just you humble yourself, boom. 
You take care of my people, boom. If you could take care of two, God will give you four. If you take care of four, God will give you eight. If you take care of eight, God will give you, come on, he'll give you the 12. That's just the way it is. And under this, we're not in competition with each other. We have an assignment. And all I want you to do is maximize everything that God called you to be.